That was phenomenal. I learned so much. And I feel like I could ask you a million questions, <laughs> but I want to be mindful. We are a little bit over on time. So I might just stick with two and then open it up to the audience because I have a feeling there'll be a lot of people here. Um, it's going to be hard for me to choose because you each actually left with great questions as part <laughs> of your um, talk. But I think the two that strike me across all four of your talks were how did these crises, how, how did this historical context of these crises open up opportunities and windows for improvement? And I think particularly for this audience, it would be great to really speak. I think, Jesse, you kind of um, summarized it at the end there, that as academics and as people who either do research um, or write about historical accounts of these events, where can this lead us for room and improvement? Because it's clear from what Professor Brandt has said that we need to do better for future epidemics. So how do we take this knowledge um, and, and leverage this in all of these very diverse communities? I mean, these are such different places that you're speaking of. But I wonder if there's some commonality, some themes that we can touch on. So I don't know if you want to go down the line and kind of work that way or? Sure. Yeah. Um, so a few comments on this. So I guess the first one, if we think uh, of we as a community here in the school, um, I think one of the, the key issues is we don't train our students in history mm. at all, mm. and we should. Um, so I think the, the first step is we have to recognize that history is important, so we try to avoid those cycles we have in public health. That, I can tell you in malaria, that's typical. We keep making the same mistakes all over again, and we keep trying to eliminate the disease all over again. So that's probably one thing we as a community could do, is to give more importance to history. Another one that I'll mention um, is uh, the political context in which those things happen. So I, I mentioned the, the response Brazil had for the Zika outbreak. If it happened this year, trust mm -hmm. me, I would be telling a very different story, and it would be much worse. So the political context matters a lot. And we, as, as academics, can do the best job in the world. If there's no political will, it's not going to make any difference. So, and, and that's how those things are interdisciplinary. If we neglect to look at the context in which we're going to deliver those responses, it can be a tremendous failure. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll mention only those two, because people may have something else to say. So. I want to say something about historical context as well. Because when we think of outbreaks, we tend to, the long durée of how far we look at something, often for a historian, is not that long. But if we look at the, uh, if there's a continuity of lack of infrastructure, or if there's a continuity of lack of communication among political groups, or if there is tension between certain sectors of society, be it because of race or because of eth ethnic tensions, we, as um, people who are interested in solutions f of health, need to be aware of these cultural components in order to offer better solutions to health. Because if we don't take this longer view or this, these other contexts, whatever solution we implement will only be short-sighted and will only be, as in your case that you illustrated, will not be a permanent solution. So I think this notion of understanding societies at a deeper level to burrow deeper into what makes each society tick. And as we know, um, just from these examples here, one pandemic was felt so differently in each of these spaces because of the societal and political situation that each of these were living. So I think in, in response to your question, it would be to be more aware of the cultural, racial, and ethnic political differences that each society faces, because that will reveal a bit more in terms of how they will respond to crises, but also how solutions can be implemented better on the ground. There was uh, one point in the... <laughs> there was one point in the Ebola uh, crisis I guess I'm on now. Okay. Yeah, yes. Uh, that sort of riveted the world's attention. And this is when uh, uh, a health group in a village in Guinea uh, was massacred. 
And mm -hmm. from the external perspective, the point was, you know, people have come from outside the world to help you. <laughs> Instead of you being grateful, this is the response we get. Uh, which speaks to Gabriela's uh, observation about the intersection mm -hmm. or the nexus of culture, ethnicity, mm -hmm. disease history. Out of his intervention, Paul Farmer decided to write a book on Ebola and Syria. The chapter that keeps getting longer is the chapter on history, which I've had the pleasure and the pain of reading. <laughs> uh, and the more he delves into his, to the global response, the more he becomes aware that one cannot make sense of Ebola in 2014-2015 without almost like deep history in Sierra Leone. Uh, so I think that it is important in our interventions. Uh, Alan spoke about global health. There is a sense in which, just as you point out, there is no foreign aid without developing countries. There's also almost like no global health without countries that require it. And Africa looms large in our imagining of global health. And we need to kind of look at it also from the African perspective. It's not something we just show up and do for the Africans. Mm -hmm. But it's also something that we do with the Africans, with the understanding of disease, which often help happen to be culturally yeah. framed. Yeah, you know, these are really important questions, and when people ask me to explain things, uh, first I apologize as a historian, and I say, okay, so in 40 BC, and you know, it's just, it's a, not a very tractable place to start, but if you really want to understand, you need a long sweep. So the thing I just told you about uh, London and the development of city councils and stuff, at that point, they had been extracting resources from India and the East Indies for 150 years and concentrating those resources. The three waves of cholera that had decimated their population, it's not like they learned the first time, but this is a more or less autonomous setting where on the third cycle of rinse and repeat, they decided, okay, let's try to figure some stuff out. You know, there's an accumulation of empirical knowledge uh, it's a history too detailed to cover here, but the, starting in the 1840s, the, there was a statistics office where uh, men and women started keeping track of who exactly was sick in the me London metropolitan area, and that allowed them some empirical basis to start figuring out what the patterns of disease were. The famous in public health example of John Snow's pump handle experiment, you know, that's in the 1850s. Well, these are things, these are luxuries that were not permitted. These were denied to other states, to states that we now call developing countries. It's not possible to tell their stories or look at their interventions without reference to this. And one way that we propagate that inequality is by having international experts come in and do quick fixes. They just can't work on that social contract. The states that now prevail in the sub-Sahara, largely they're extractive states set up to constrain and abuse their citizens. In the handover of independence, not all that was undone. If you undo that, then you have the conditions where states and citizens can collaborate again and can be productive. It's a really long process, but I urge all of us to think about how we're contributing. In some ways, it's very positive where we have students from around the world. Students come, they get ideas, they go and they do whatever. So we're not telling exactly. But we're also propagating a very technologic and bureaucratic model of disease control. And that's not really how these systems get built. They get built around a shared understanding. So where we talk about public health, we know we need to move the middle and the lower tail of the distribution. But then our interventions are all up here in the elite things. And that's important, we keep doing it, but we should also think about the other stuff. Great, do we, do we have time for one more up here? No one's gonna say it too audibly, no? Okay, we'll do one more and then we'll open it up. I could ask you guys questions all day, it's so fascinating. <laughs> I, as you're talking, I keep coming up with thoughts. I think the second, the last one I'll do, and then I'll open it up. 
is, um, you know, I think Professor Grant, you were talking a lot about this kind of biosocial aspect of these pandemics. And last night there was a discussion about how do we stop epidemics becoming pandemics? What are the aspects that we could be doing better? And I think, again, this feeds into the point you were just making. We are training young people to go out into the world. Um, we're all educators at some level as well as researchers. What are the messages that we need to be thinking about in the context of this history that these different countries have faced politically, exploitation, and, and almost turning on this moment in time that is culturally so challenging in this country? And how do we kind of, as a higher level of understanding, move the history forward? Do you want to, do you want me to go down this way this time? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, there, there are lots of young people. I enjoy teaching the classes, uh, advising and mentoring. And so here in a public forum, I'll give some more advice. Look, one is don't pay too much attention to the classes. You know, we have classes on disparities that don't mention slavery. We have classes on global health that don't talk about colonialism. These things are just wrong. So get some tools, get some ideas, and then go start the revolution. <laughs> 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 Sorry, <I'll take> <laughs> <laughs> the center for, I always forget, I turn it off so that it doesn't matter. The Center for African Studies has made uh, help one of its core components, which is uh, rather unusual for an area studies center. Uh, each time I talk about health, Paul Farmer quickly qualifies it as art and health care. Delivery. That the two must always go together. Uh, David Shumway Jones made an observation that the moment a country, whether Africa or Asia or in the Arab world, treats its head of state instead of sending them overseas for medical treatment mm. in the health crisis, that then shows that the country has come of age. Mm. There is a sense in which we talk about global health and all these things. But the importance of health care infrastructure within these countries and how we need to strengthen their capacity to deliver health care. There's a sense in which the world is becoming dichotomous in the way you point out. Certain things happen. We call CDC, we call other places to come. Uh, but the, the need to, to strengthen the capacity to deliver health care in the developing world, in Africa, my country, is crucial. Because otherwise, uh, we will always be recipients of interventions from the global And we need to move forward. I think when we look for global health solutions, we tend to think that it's a north-south wave of communication. And I think one of the problems that we face in our world is that it's not a dialogue, and that there are many solutions that are found in the global south that could benefit the globe. Um, and there's one wonderful example. In the late 1970s, Mexico um, discovers this oil reserves that they believe are larger than Saudi Arabia. So it allows the government to begin to fantasize what it would do if it was a wealthy country. The story doesn't end well, but for, um, <laughs> for a few years, Mexico believes that it is a wealthy country. And it sends out a series of anthropologists and sociologists and historians into the countryside to try to find out what does poverty mean, not as it was defined in Washington, but what does poverty mean on a Mexican scale? And it turns out that the definition is very different. And what they decide is that to, uh, to tackle poverty, they're going to have to do a four approach. And it's going to be education, it's going to be housing, it's going to be nutrition, and most important, it's going to be health. And they're going to design health models that are Mexican models. And that is the point that I'm trying to make. And they realize that in Mexico, there has been a millennia of healing practices, that they have had um, 
healing with plants that have sustained the society. So how can these come together? And in the 1970s, they come up with a program. And it's about incorporating traditional healers into institution, health institutions. It's a fantastic program. But with the, uh, the economic crisis of 1982, it's defunded. But it kind of staggers on, and Mexico manages to export it to other countries, Bolsa Familia in Brazil, uh, doing blo during Bloomberg's um, tenure as mayor of New York, he imported it into New York as Opportunity New York City. It was based on a Mexican model. And it was about listening to local people, bringing in public health officials to local spaces. And I'll just end on this. Public health training has shifted, has, uh, shifted a lot in, in meaning in Mexico. It, it, meant, it used to mean that public health students would go into communities. They would learn from the people. They would be the ones who were communicating to larger institutions. And now it means much more statistical model, modeling and communicating with a computer. So I think to respond to your question, we need to reframe how we're thinking of community and how we're thinking of solutions to not just local health, but global health, taking into consideration a much larger dialogue with other spaces that we normally do not take into consideration. So um, I guess following up on Jess, um, as you go for your revolution, what I would say <laughs> is uh, choose well where you're going to fight for. First of all, you're here. You're not going to learn public health to just stay in the nice classrooms here. You've got to go to the field. That's how you do the revolution. The second thing is, um, you know, the revolution starts with the health system. So Brazil back in 88 came up with a universal free access health system. Health became a right written in the Constitution, that was a community movement. That was a society movement. It wasn't the government that decided to do it. That's a revolution. It's completely collapsing now because Brazil is a mess, but, you know, that's another revolution that we need to do. And the other thing is you have to recognize that it's not just about fighting when an epidemic comes, but it's fighting for things that are not under the responsibility of the Minister of Health. The Minister of Health does not put pipes in a city and does not provide infrastructure. But that's much better than trying to modify a mosquito. Don't get me wrong, but I'm always scared of those things. We don't have a good record in messing up with nature, really. So, you know, it's fighting for primary care. It's fighting for other solutions that help health but are not directly under the purview of the Minister of Health. So that's going to prevent you from fighting a revolution when the epidemic comes, but you're going to do things that will probably prevent that local outbreak from becoming a pandemic, which is, I think, was your question. So, That's fabulous. Thank you. Why don't we take maybe a few questions from the floor? Yeah, go ahead. It's a different perspective. You bet, Mike. Thank you for the mic. Uh, this is a different perspective, but I'm curious with your wise thinking and um, advice uh, on this great panel. Thank you very much. Um, my contention to some degree is that when we go and bring a Western model to places like Nicaragua, which I've volunteered in for many, many years, and uh, other places in the world, that in the best intentions to eradicate illness and to present our wisdom that we also destroy the infrastructure, the cultural infrastructure of health defined by happiness. Can you please comment on that? Thank you. Are you going to take a few questions? Or? Um, yeah. Okay, why don't we take maybe two more, and then we can kind of have the panelists kind of answer. So, okay, so destroying kind of local infrastructure as outsiders. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I'm interested in the, the kind of concept that we've talked about knowing and the fact that we know quite a lot and the gap between knowing and doing, um, which you've all highlighted, um, and whether you could maybe comment on the role of leaders and leadership in closing the knowing doing gap. Great. So, role of leaders in closing the knowing and doing gap. Um, okay. Why don't we do these? Okay. Uh, all right. We'll try to get all three, and then well, that'll be it. <laughs> 
Um, I come from the evicted school of MIT, and I work with <laughs> biological engineering. And I'm curious, like, what are the practical ways that engineers and researchers can engage with these questions of infrastructure at that part of the pipeline? Because you're talking a lot about intersection, and I want to know, like, what kind of practical methods you see? Okay. Practical. Engineers, researchers, great. Yeah, hi. My question is more around how it's for chikungunya and dengue and many of the infectious diseases back in India. I've seen some individual excellences in their alternative medicine or the traditional medicine of India. So how to bring the best of the East, few models from there and the best of the West to handle this complex situation, if you could throw some light in. So really combining the best in both, in all cultures. Okay. Okay, and last one, I think, was over there. Thank you. So I'd like to just uh, riff a little bit off Jesse's comment as he referred to something called the modern state um, and uh, ask the panelists if they would share some thoughts about alternative visions of how the modern state could play a role in uh, addressing epidemics and outbreaks if we move away from the United States as a model of the modern state. In the early days of WHO, there was a much more diverse set of models of the state, mm -hmm. dominated to some degree by the Soviet Union at that time and other spin-off states from that, which were much advanced on the United States in terms of public health. But today, with power concentrated in Washington and on the East Coast of the United States, mm -hmm. we see much less of that. Okay. Richard had a question. Oh, we don't, right? Mm. I, I think okay, that's if fine. We, uh, yeah, there's some way. Now, do you guys uh, feel like you can answer these? So we had destroying local infrastructures, outsider, knowing and doing gap roles of leaders, um, bringing this practical aspect of engineers, researchers together, combining cultures, and the role of the modern state and how it plays a role in epidemics. So maybe choose two or three that tantalize <laughs> you, and then we'll just go down the line. Hopefully you'll choose different ones so we can speak to those. OK, so um, let me start with the question on the engineers. Um, so if you go back again, back in history, um, so there used to be this figure called sanitary engineer. Um, and every single malaria control campaign had that person in there. and. Um, that figure was eradicated in the eradication campaign, um, disappeared. We lost this knowledge, and uh, that integration is pretty much gone. If you go to the, to the catalog, the very first catalog of our school, it, it's all online now, you're actually going to find that discipline in there, and this is gone. So there's a huge potential. I mean, how can you think about urban planning and putting all the infrastructure in a city and that's really critical when you think about Aedes aegypti, which is an urban vector, right? If you don't bring together health, urban planning, and engineers, and transportation for that matter, in agriculture, if you have urban agriculture. So there is a tremendous room for it, but neither health is approaching the engineers, and I'm glad to see you here, so you're approaching health, so there's hope. Um, and the... We'll probably tackle the other one, which is the gap between knowing and doing. It depends on the leader, really. I mean, depending on the leader, the leader is actually going to put investment in producing knowledge even, even more and then reduce the gap. So the answer for that depends on the country, depends on the epidemic, depends on the context. We have good examples on how this gap was uh, reduced, and we have other examples on how this was a disaster and then what was done on the ground was completely detached from the needs that, that we had to do at that time. So um, to your, the first question, um, it reminded me of, because I'm a historian, I think, um, in terms of decades ago, but when the Rockefeller Foundation first went into Latin America, in particular in Mexico, had this campaign to end hookworm disease, which had been as many of you here know, initially a problem in the United States South. And it was so successful that they decided to export it not just to Latin America, but to the rest of the world. And in Mexico, something really curious happens. That Mexico says, we don't really have a problem with hookworm, 
And can, but we do have a problem with tuberculosis. Can you instead give us you know, a, a structure to help us with that? And we have a lot of issues with intestinal diseases. And what we really need are shoes, not really uh, these you know, beautiful things that tell us how the hookworm disease, how the hookworm goes up. So to answer your question, what was lacking there were uh, several things. Number one was communication with local authorities, but also local health officials. There was a, a lack of respect for local healing practices. And I think if we really are going to ch change what's happening, we need to reframe how we conceive of as aid. Because aid is, is, a, is a development project conception. And if we enter these spaces with a development model, that, that we, what we're going to do is help rather than thinking, this is our world. And if one, if one corner of the world is sick, we can potentially all get infected. So thinking more in terms of helping and not necessarily aid, which has this connotation that goes with it. So in, in, that's just uh, my first thought on that. And my second um, alternative visions of the state or mod mo the modern state when I was in Havana, I was very struck by the community doctors. And for those of you who've been there, you know that each community, each doctor has a community of up to 1,500 that they take care of. And the doctor knows everyone by name. And of course, this is an island. And this could probably not be replicated because this is an island. But the fact that what struck me, what struck me was that we have lost much of that personal connection. And if we are going to find solutions, I think we need to go back as a modern state to this, and I keep going back to this notion of community, where it was the physician who would be able to say, well, so-and-so, I've noticed that this is going on. They may be doing drugs. Let's intervene as a community, as a first line of defense, before it becomes an epidemic, before it becomes something. And I think this notion of thinking smaller as a modern state, instead of thinking of these large global solutions, might have more impact on the ground and as a ripple effect for a larger society. Okay. I often get told to tear it off when I'm not speaking. So very quickly, uh, let me pick up from uh, Master's comment. Uh, and, uh, the sort of loss of the sanitary engineer. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of Africa, of the importance of malaria control and how sanitation mm -hmm. and the sanitary engineer mm -hmm. were at the very mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also many other things that we've lost. Uh, in terms of even extension work, we've lost all the extension workers. There, there's a sense in which the move from the 1980s towards a minimal or a reduced state has undercut the capacity yeah. to regulate public health yeah. in important ways. Uh, in the last 18 years, we've seen perhaps as many dams, hydroelectric dams <coughs> being built in Africa, as were built in the first 20 years of independence, and then there was this hiatus. The implications for changes in hydrology, mm -hmm. disease, immense. But we've lost that capacity for research that accompanied the first couple of decades when we built dams. And, and so the, the, these important dimensions where I think practical approaches, engineers, research coming together. But unfortunately, in terms of Africa, the state seems to lose its capacity to facilitate these things. Uh, and then uh, maybe about alternative medicine, indigenous therapies. There's a sense in which in many African places, depending on where you live, if you live away from the main cities, your access to hospitals and to clinics are very limited. You turn first to the herbalist in your neighborhood for your treatment. But uh, uh, there is also this tension between the reality of medical plurality. And the fact that in many African countries, actually, medical doctors are those least 
interested in any collaborative endeavor with those who work from indigenous practices. Mm -hmm. To take one little example, uh, I wrote clinic and psychiatry in, 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 in Nigeria became famous through T.A. Lambo, who tried to bring together psychiatric practice with indigenous healers who also treated mental illness. Was lauded for its community practice, etc., etc., etc. The moment he, he got poached by WHO because of the success of our mm -hmm. The moment he went to WHO, his successors would actually ask Aru and this collaboration between psychiatrists and indigenous healers when it came to mental illness. So, so, so there is the reality that we have underfunded ministries of health, and that we need to draw these in. But there's also this tension between medical doctors who seem unwilling to concede space towards heritage therapies. Mm -hmm. These are, so, so far, you know, three really compelling explanations for the questions that, that were asked. And I'd, I'd like to offer a different one, uh, just for the sake of variety, uh, that's complementary to these and covers uh, it, at least four of the questions that were asked about, you know, how does the Western model fit with other cultures? How does the knowing and doing get divided? Uh, how do engineers end up on their own? Uh, how do they engage again? And then alternative visions of the state. And to me, th these are all connected to the thus far imperfect and incomplete professionalization of public health. So back in, you know, 100 years ago, there were competing visions of what public health should be. And some models emphasized education. Others had more engineering. Others had social science. And the bacteriology model won. So uh, William Welch at Johns Hopkins, founded in 1916, and then Rosenau here in 1922, the, they, they had both studied in Germany, and they had this idea of running a bacteriology lab. And at the time where the public was really engaged with infectious diseases, the scientific finding of a pathogen and its etiology of diseases, well, that was enough to get governments and citizens to pay attention and reorganize themselves. So at the time, their model of public health and then professionalized around, or, or sort of professionalized it, because it's always by physicians. So they have one identity, and then you add this on. They, they were not looking for a way to build an independent profession that had its own authority. And they didn't really worry too much about this state citizen stuff I mentioned before, because citizens were so engaged in it. As the 20th century has moved on, the power of that model has been revealed. It's enormously successful. The expansion of life expectancy shows you the power of technical intervention. But where citizens are less engaged, such as in uh, habit and diseases, like with tobacco, uh, personal, uh, it's not personal choices, but uh, the sort of habit and lifestyle things or patterns, like in all the NCD risk factors, there, where public health doesn't have engagement, it also doesn't have authority. So our, you know, our DNA is part of this kind of reduction of disease to causal agents. Even though we like to talk about social epidemiology, we still don't have a toolkit that makes it easy to intervene elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And we've never developed a professional authority. So some of the other competing models had, there's one I call the workforce model. Um, it's it, it, the same guy designed the UNC system. So this is like where you have extension workers, then you have regional state universities, then you have a, national, a, a, a regional state university where you know, the, the research trickles down into practice easily. That's just not what we're doing here. There was a social science model that had a lot of behavior change in it, and those lost out. Now, I'm not saying that we should have done that. It's just now we need to do those things. The choices we didn't make now correspond to problems that we have. I think this is a great time to open up the discussion again and ask, well, when we decided not to engage engineers and relegate sanitary engineering to something else, um, what problems and authorities did we give up and should we get some of them back? To see how complete this, question, this issue is, imagine a law school. Law schools are function, laws are a functioning profession. Imagine a law school where most of the faculty weren't trained as lawyers. That's like a school of public health. 
You got a little of this, a little of that. The chaos of it is really interesting and it's a great time to be here, but it shows you the profession hasn't yet codified exactly what the skills are. And I would say, look, 100 years ago, the skills of bacteriology matched really well with the infectious disease burden. So look again, look at the NCDs, uh, look at the social problems, and then say, okay, well, even though we have a lot of inertia behind us and there are strong tendencies, which direction should we go to better, better engage the current problems, the ones that have to do with sort of the non-infectious factors? So you keep what you have, but then bend it toward, and that, that's how you'll start to close the knowledge gap where we just don't have the authority. We can't go out and do it. With the engineers, uh, we forgot how to talk to them. A lot of questions like that. Well, this was great, and I really want to thank our fabulous panelists. Thank you so much.